pomegranates and mayhaws and also olives. This morning we'll be, we will be focusing on blueberries and he is about to give the Georgia blueberry pathology update. All right, Dr. Oliver. Thank you, Tony. Um, so this morning uh, I will be talking to you about uh, blueberry pathology and uh, but first uh, let you know that I am uh, at the University of Georgia and I'm based in Tifton. Uh, and I've, I've been in this position for about three years, and so I'm glad to be with you again uh, this year at the uh, Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference. So um, for today's talk, I'm going to be speaking uh, first about some of the diseases that we've diagnosed uh, this year on blueberry that, the, that were submitted to the Diagnostic Clinic in Athens. I'm also gonna be talking to you about uh, a little more in depth about some specific blueberry issues that we encountered uh, this last year. Uh, and then I'll move into talking about some management updates um, on a couple of, of key diseases on ripe rot and mummy berry of blueberry. And then I'll end by talking about uh, updates to the seasonal spray schedule for blueberries. First, the diagnostic summary. So uh, samples submitted uh, during 2020 to the plant disease clinic um, from blueberries uh, largely showed uh, root disease issues. We had a lot of phytophthora, as has been the case for the last several years. This continues to be our most frequently diagnosed disease issue on blueberry. Uh, in addition, we had uh, um, other diseases, including fruit rots and leaf spots uh, that were problematic during 2020, uh, and rust uh, epidemics continue to be a problem on blueberry, um, showing up earlier and earlier every season uh, following uh, the warmer winters that we've been having. And so uh, rust continues to be a problem, and really I believe growers need to be addressing rust earlier in the season uh, to make sure they're, they're getting adequate control, even though in the past uh, management after harvest has been kind of the norm. Uh, moving into some specific issues uh, that we encountered um, during 2020, uh, one is very significant problems with yeast rot. And so yeast rot on, on, during the rabbit eye harvest was a major issue uh, in late May of this last year. Uh, several growers and packing houses in Georgia began reporting severe problems with fruit quality. Um, soft and splitting fruit were common, and diagnostic samples were noted to be heavily infested with yeasts. Uh, as a result of these issues, uh, a lot of our packing houses were forced to reject loads, uh, numerous loads of harvested fruit, and many packing lines shut down early across the southern part of Georgia. Um, many of the har growers abandoned their harvest completely uh, due to these fruit quality issues and, of course, economic losses from that are significant. And you can see some of the fruit splits that were evident in the field on our rabbit eyes this year and the picture on the right. Uh, yeast rot is usually a sporadic post-harvest issue. It's caused by the fungus Aerobacidium pullulans. And this fungus is actually a fairly weak pathogen. Um, it's usually not a major issue unless the berries are suffering from some other kinds of stress um, or wounding. So the fruit um, is colonized by the fungus um, on the surface. And if there are wounds that appear, that allows the fungus to cause yeast rot. And when it causes yeast rot, you get this rapid collapse and this wet, slimy appearance um, that, that occurs. And obviously, these fruit are entirely unmarketable. So we think, um, though we don't really know because a lot of research has not been done on yeast rot, but we would assume that warm, wet, and humid conditions uh, favor the growth of this fungus. Um, and with how sudden and widespread this issue was in Georgia uh, in 2020, it's really likely that environmental conditions were key uh, for this issue. So what were some of those environmental conditions? Well, we saw um, the green star here indicates when uh, the yeast rot problems really uh, became evident. Uh, in the field and in the packing houses. And we, we saw right before that a rapid uh, rise in overnight temperatures um, during the last half of May, uh, shaded here in yellow on this graph. This is data from Alma, Georgia. And the temperatures overnight really switched from a fairly cool pattern um, in the spring to a very warm pattern uh, that was typical of summer uh, in a very short period of time in mid-May. And um, during that time also, right in the center of, of this yellow shaded area, if you look at the graph on the right, um, you can see that we had uh, one particular uh, large rainfall event uh, across southern Georgia, a day to here is from Alma. And in Alma, they had uh, 2.3 inches of rain in that single day. And this can be a big problem, as many of our growers know, um, when you have rainfall or excessive irrigation right before harvest, because the fruit um, can imbibe the water uh, through the surface of the fruit, and the skin at that point is not really able to expand um, uh, to hold that water that it's taken in, and so you can get the fruit splitting. And we saw lots of fruit splits, and they're probably due to this warming temperature, but even more so to this, um, 
this very high level of rain we saw on May 22nd. So yeast rot issues are typically really sporadic and infrequent. Um, and as a result, there really hasn't been a lot of work done um, on what can be done to manage yeast rots. The only things we know for sure are that uh, timely harvesting and proper handling of ripe fruit are key uh, for, for managing ripe, uh, yeast rot issues. Um, so basically proper cooling of the fruit after harvest and a harvesting before the fruit get overly ripe in the field can be important. But beyond that, um, it's such a sporadic issue that not a lot of work has been done previously on looking at management of yeast rot. So we don't really know what was causing the yeast rot in 2020 for sure, but it's likely these kind of unique environmental conditions that I just described are um, part, at least partially account for this issue. Uh, again, those were the fruit splits, uh, probably resulting from an extreme rainfall event in late May and rapidly warming nighttime temperatures after we had a fairly long period of cool temperatures uh, during berry development. Uh, these these conditions likely provided ideal conditions for the growth of yeast on the blueberries this year. Another uh, issue uh, that arose during 2020 is we found for the first time that uh, bacterial wilt um, of blueberry uh, was present in Georgia. And so bacterial wilt is caused by Ralstonia solanaceae and it was first I identified um, on blueberry in three farms in Florida back in 2016. But since that time, it's been shown to um, have spread uh, throughout the state of Florida. And we've been trying to look for it in Georgia uh, during the last three years. So we've sampled from uh, multiple blueberry growing counties across the southern part of the state. And in 2018 and 2019, we didn't find any bacterial wilt. But for the first time in 2020, in two locations in Clinch County, uh, we, we found bacterial wilt of blueberry. So what did we see in those locations? Well, um, both of those locations uh, happened to be growing the Indigo Crisp cultivar of blueberry, and we saw a, a, a site similar to this, so uh, as shown on this slide. So um, we can see fairly healthy blueberries you know, kind of far away down these rows, and we saw fairly um, healthy blueberries on the left and on the right. Um, but we did, but the, those three rows that were affected uh, were severely impacted um, by bacteria wilt. And you can see a lot of the plants here are dying and defoliating. We see smaller plants on the left that um, have been where the growers tried to replant into this site, um, but really a large uh, circular area uh, was showing uh, these severe symptoms um, of bacteria wilt. And uh, if we look closer at the plants, we can see uh, more specifically what some of those symptoms are. Um, those symptoms include uh, marginal leaf necrosis, wilting, and plant death in as little as three weeks after infection. So they were rapidly progressing one plant to another down the row. Uh, plants were dying. These symptoms kind of can resemble bacterial leaf scorch uh, or Phytophthora root rot. Um, and we tested for both of those issues uh, prior to testing for bacterial wilt. But it turns out that these plants were infected with uh, Ralstonia solanaceae. Um, What's known from Florida about bacterial wilt is that some cultivars are highly susceptible uh, to bacterial wilt. And these cultivars include Arcadia, Indigo Crisp, and Key Crisp. So perhaps it's not surprising that the first time we identified bacterial wilt in Georgia, it was affecting Indigo Crisp. Uh, and that was the case at both of these locations. Emerald Farthing and Meadowlark are also susceptible to bacterial wilt, though they're considered more moderately susceptible. Ralstonia solanaceae is easily spread um, through water, soil, or infected plant material, and it's often spread down rows. And this is because the soil gets picked up by farm equipment or farm workers and moved down the row. And we definitely saw that in both these locations. Uh, management largely relies on prevention, so keeping the pathogen out or limiting the movement of infected plants, equipment, and soil between farms and ultimately burning infected plant materials. There's no cure for bacterial wilt. Um, those plants should be removed and destroyed and not spread around um, to continue spreading this disease. We don't really have a lot of good information on what chemical controls may be effective for bacterial wilt. Um, a couple of years of, of, of looking at soil drenches in Florida have shown that uh, soil drenches with uh, things like kphite or other phosphonate fungicides may have some efficacy for protecting nearby plants from, infected, uh, from infection. Um, but it's not going to cure uh, plants that are already showing symptoms and are already infected. Another thing that can be done is prior to replanting into infected fields, uh, potted plants can be drenched with phosphonate products, and this can protect them hopefully long enough for the plant to become established and um, perhaps uh, survive in, in this location. But it's, most of this information is, is just based on very limited uh, 
data from Florida, and uh, it's kind of assumed that this may be effective based on other crop systems, including things like geranium, which are not fairly very close to blueberries. And so we don't really have a lot of good answers as far as what we got to manage bacterial oil once it's in the site. Another issue we saw this uh, last year was some problems with phytotoxicity occurring on blueberry fruit. So oils or EC formulations of pesticides can damage plants when they're improperly applied. Um, and if they're applied in really hot weather or if they're applied in improper tank mixes. And we saw a uh, fruit like this uh, this year. I was sent these pictures from uh, one of our county agents, um, from a grower who was having problems with, with this issue on his fruit. And at first we weren't sure what it was, but after a consultation with the agent and the grower, uh, we realized that they'd been sprayed recently with a tank mix of cat tan, sniper, and malathion EC. And it's likely that the tank mix of cat tan and the EC product resulted in this phytotoxicity. So cat tan is really important, um, but some cautions about it. Um, it's very important, it's crucial for fungicide resistance management. I encourage you to include cat tan in tank mixes um, when you're managing diseases. Um, however, uh, tank mixes of cat tan and oils or cat tan and EC formulations are not recommended. So the label for cat tan specifically says not to apply cat tan in combination with or in close proximity to oil sprays. And likewise, we've seen issues occasionally from cat tan and EC formulations causing phytotoxicity. And the reason this happens is when you apply those together, the oils or the EC formulation will allow the cat tan to penetrate into the plant, which it normally does not do, and then it can cause damage inside. And so that's what you see on the fruit here. Um, moving into a couple of uh, field uh, trials that we did this last year on ripe rot and blueberry, we have some updates to give on management of uh, ripe rot of blueberry and hummingbird. Anthracnose fruit rot or ripe rot is caused by two different species of the fungus Colitoctricum. And fruit infections for ripe rot begin at bloom and they remain latent until ripening. And so um, this can be a major issue post-harvest, but actually infection is occurring all the way back at bloom. So the fungus infects at bloom and just kind of hangs around until the fruit starts to blue up. And once the sugars begin to rise in the fruit, um, the fungus begins to grow rapidly and it can cause the berries to shrivel. And the fungus in some cases can even sporulate on the outside of the fruit with these orange or these yellow uh, spores. And these spores can be moved by water droplets or in clamshells, once you've harvested them, any fruit that's touching those spores can then become infected and it can cause a significant loss of, of, of fruit uh, post-harvest. Um, warm and wet weather during bloom and just before harvest typically favor development of problems with ripe rot. Ripe rot also has uh, the issue that the fungus uh, very frequently develops fungicide resistance. So anthracnose resistance uh, to QOI fungicides, specifically a bound and pristine, is well known in Florida on uh, blueberries now. And we have um, we have found that uh, some isolates in Georgia now, uh, back in 2019, we found isolates that were resistant to pristine. And these isolates were found in Blackshear, Georgia, and they possessed a mutation known to confer resistance in all colitoctrophic species to QOI fungicides. And uh, we anticipated uh, during 2020 uh, surveying um, harvested blueberries for the presence of fungicide resistant uh, ripe rot fungus, um, but due to lockdown and things that happened in April and uh, March, April and May, we weren't able to do that, but we anticipate uh, having a better understanding of where fungicide resistance may be present in Georgia uh, after a survey in 2021. But thinking about management of ripe rot, um, fungicides should be applied during bloom and cover sprays. Um, and the fungicides that are recommended in the blueberry guide um, are listed here. Um, but you'll see several of those are QOI fungicides. And if we remove those QOI fungicides because we have fungicide resistance, we're left with very limited options for management of ripe rot. Um, so we would encourage growers to rotate the available modes of action, uh, switch, omega, captan, and xyram um, to, for achieving uh, management of ripe rot. And um, if you're applying other fungicides, we encourage tank mixes with a low risk fungicide like captan. But you see that a couple of these, omega and xyram, have some issues as far as being used uh, pre harvest. So one has a 30 day pre harvest interval, and one has this language that says do not apply later than three weeks after full bloom. So options are really limited for growers if they can't use QOI fungicides for managing ripe rot. 
So we did a field trial in a couple of locations in Bacon and Pierce County this last year. And um, we found that uh, fruit was being affected um, by ripe rots and other fruit rots. Well, we applied um, several different uh, treatments at either 30% bloom, petal fall, 10 days after petal fall, three weeks after petal, petal fall or pre-harvest, and each of these disease programs. So they either got switch, captan or Xyram, switch Moravis Prime or Luna Tranquility, captan or Omega, switch Moravis Prime or Luna Tranquility. Um, and what we see here on the right, um, green indicates uh, results where the, the ripe rot or the all or, or all rots have been reduced significantly by the treatment program is that um, several of these spray programs were very effective for ripe rot management. Um, and the best program was actually a program using Switch, Captan, and Moravis Prime, which reduced both ripe rot and all rots in both locations. Um, the worst treatment program uh, substituted uh, Luna Tranquility for Switch for two of the sprays. And this treatment program was not effective for managing ripe rot. So based on this information, I would say that all of these products are effective for ripe rot, except for Luna Tranquility. And Moravis Prime, based on this information, um, will be included in the Blueberry Guide um, during 2021 as providing control that is comparable to switch. Another uh, fungus disease that we have a problem with um, in Georgia is mummyberry. And so mummyberry is caused by the fungus Monolinia vaccinii corymbosi. And uh, this fungus causes a shoot blight and then will eventually infect the fruit. And when it colonizes the fruit, it leads to fruit mummification. This is usually a problem in Georgia, mostly on rabbit eye, especially in the southern part of the state, because the timing of when the fungus is producing its spores and when plants are most susceptible lines up better with the development of rabbit eye. Southern highbush across the southern part of Georgia usually don't have to uh, worry. Uh, southern highbush growers don't have to worry about mummyberry. Uh, it is not likely to be a problem on southern highbush in the southern part of the state because they break bud earlier and they bloom earlier. But um, mummyberry's disease cycle is interesting because these mummies that are on the ground, what happens is they form these cup mushrooms or these apothecia, which sporulate and infect the brand new fresh green tissue. And this fresh green tissue um, gets infected and then as the leaves develop from, from, from this, um, they, they will sporulate and these spores will infect the flowers and from the infection of the blooms, you get fruit infection and then fruit mummification and then the cycle continues. So uh, burying the mummies or eliminating the mummies from the field can help with management, but it's usually not sufficient for control. Usually you need to use chemical controls. Um, and so fungicide applications are made from green tip through bloom uh, to manage mummy berry. And so pristine and the DMI fungicides are typically what's recommended um, for uh, mummy berry management. And uh, another note is that when you use uh, DMI fungicides, um, we'd encourage you to tank mix those with captan because DMI fungicides have been found to actually make ripe rot worse. They're very helpful for mummy berry management, but if used by themselves, they can make ripe rot uh, much worse. And so if you tank mix those with captan, you can control both mummy berry and ripe rot. We did a couple of field trials looking at, at different um, sprays for mummyberry this past year, and the data is shown here. And you can see that, as is indicated in green, all of these uh, treatment programs work pretty well for the management of mummyberry, uh, particularly all the DMI fungicides, uh, including Propulse, which has not been recommended previously for mummyberry control, uh, were very effective, as well as Luna Tranquility. So to flip the story from ripe rot, uh, with, where Luna Tranquility didn't seem to be effective, it seems to be very effective for the management of uh, mummyberry. And it will be included as a result in the 2021 edition of the Blueberry Spray Guide as one of the fungicides which would be recommended uh, for mummyberry uh, control. Moving into the last part of my talk, I wanna briefly talk about the seasonal spray schedule for blueberries. So the seasonal spray schedule um, really has to take into account when diseases are present in the field. And so exobacidium, um, mummyberry, twig blight, fruit rots, botrytis, leaf spots, and botrysferia all kind of occur and should be managed at differing times during uh, the season. And those times are shown kind of in the middle here, the, from late dormant all the way through after harvest. And so at each of these times, um, certain applications of fungicides can be effective for managing these diseases as they occur. And I've tried to color code this information um, above this line and showed some examples of uh, fungicides which can be used for control.
So a pristine or a DMI fungicide, for example, can be applied at green tip to give control of both mummyberry and twig blight. Um, and then starting at bloom all the way through harvest, I, um, you can see that we encourage the application of captan, 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 captan uh, in tank mixes for the management of fruit rots uh, and also the, the potential management of fungicide resistance. And uh, I'd encourage growers who are having problems with ripe rot to incorporate a spray around bloom of switch and captan or a similar product to switch um, to, help manage, uh, ripe, to help manage ripe rot. And, but additional applications of effective products against ripe rot uh, will, will be needed uh, up until harvest. Uh, I also would encourage growers um, in, during the cover spray period to apply a DMI fungicide um, if they've had problems with rust. Uh, rust seems to be getting, uh, getting going earlier every year. And so I encourage growers to apply a DMI fungicide uh, with captan in a tank mix um, to help manage rust. Um, to develop your own spray program, you can consult the Southeastern Regional Blueberry Guide, um, which is available at smallfruits.org. And the 2021 edition of this should be available soon. And within that guide, you'll find something very similar to what I showed you with the seasonal spray schedule in that you'll see the different developmental stages of blueberries across the top of this table. Uh, you'll also see the diseases that are important at each of these developmental stages and a list of fungicides uh, that are recommended uh, for control of each of those disease issues. So you can develop your own spray program um, using the fungicides that you prefer. Uh, Additional information is found through the My IPM app, which provides information on efficacy of these fungicides and also pictures of several of these different diseases. And it's available free on the App Store or Google Play. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you may have. And thank you.